Welcome to Beyond Extend for our next workshop. I'm Timothy Dries, a game environment artist and host of this workshop. For this one, we have Derek Elsoff, who is a material artist at Massive Entertainment, showing us how they use a unique background to explore different ways of material creation. This workshop is a long one, so sit back, relax, and make sure to use the different chapters on the video if you want to skip ahead. And with all that said, I'll hand it over to Derek. Thank you. All right, I'm Derek. I'm from the Netherlands, and I'm a material artist at Massive Entertainment. Uh, let's see the next slide. So this is kind of the summary on this workshop. Uh, I will start with an introduction of myself, look at some old work and how I started as a material artist just to, you know, get the, get some inspiration perhaps on, uh, on my journey. Uh, I will highlight some of my heroes throughout the years I've been doing material art and getting into art myself. Um, I will mention some of the resources and reference I use and then we deep dive into the material creation of the set of materials I've made. Um, and then we might do some live doodling depending on how much time we have left. Um, so within the workshop I will explain um, how I created a bunch of materials that are now on screen, uh, creating a full set of biomaterials. Uh, so I will, I will go through some of the graphs, uh, how to create soil, how to set up atlas textures for those materials, and how to do uh, scattering in designer to, to bring everything together. Um, and within, within this uh, material set, I've used a bunch of different programs. So I'll probably uh, highlight some things in designer, world machine, Photoshop, ZBrush, maybe some substance 3D sampler, and perhaps some ZBrush and Maya as well. Um, let's go back to the slide. So this is me and my portfolio. Um, so generally I like to do organic materials. Uh, so MC Escher is kind of my, uh, my biggest inspiration when I was younger. I mean, it kind of is maybe kind of ironic. Uh, it has a lot of patterns and I, I generally get inspired of the patterns and how we made the transitions going from triangles to birds, bees, and that's like kind of cool stuff. So I just want to give a shout out to my boy, MC, MC Asher. Um, so now goes the, uh, now comes the old work time machine. And for those who don't know, old work time machine is a channel in this discord from beyond the sand where you can post some of your old stuff. Um, so as a material artist, I always liked creating spheres. So I looked at some of my old stuff and as you can see, I kind of, I kind of have a thing for planets. So maybe that's why I like to be a material artist since as a material artist, you usually make some nice, uh, sphere renders for your art station profile. So maybe that's something, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's the deep ingrained into my uh, artist career. Um, so yeah, I, I used to make like a lot of planets with Photoshop and, and using a lot of mixed techniques to create like a, a nice sphere. So I would use a lot of photo sourcing, uh, do a lot of digital painting. Uh, and when I started doing digital painting, I got inspired a lot by Dylan Cole. Dylan Cole is a pretty famous matte painter. Uh, art director and uh, concept artist for a lot of different movies. Um, so this is what, what I kind of used to do before I started doing material art, uh, which has been a lot of fun. And uh, what I liked about doing those uh, digital paintings was usually just messing around with different noises and, and uh, using a lot of photo references, photo images to create uh, different things. Like you would use clouds to create a galaxy or I would use uh, sp specific grinds or, or cracks to create like uh, different shapes that I could use for like the planet itself. So there's a lot of photo sourcing uh, used to create something uh, totally different. I think um, within material creation, the only thing I'm doing mainly is just looking at different patterns that I can use in materials and then trying to to come up with ways to uh, 
uh, create a material from something uh, from a noise that, that looked kind of interesting. Um, let's see. I go back to my slide. So this is also some of the old work. So I like to do traditional art as well. So, you know, painting with paint and see if you can make some nice texture maps and then come up with an image that uh, looks appealing to me. Um, so in generally in my work, you know, I kind of embrace, embrace, embrace this beautiful Afro man, Bob Ross. Um, you know, allowing for happy accidents. That's, that's definitely key. Um, so this is some of the work I've done in 2017 and uh, during university I had a lot of um, possibilities to do a lot of experimentation so um, as a material artist I don't want to be only doing the substance design right you want to be trying different techniques different ways of creating things and before I started doing designer I during art school, I used to do some Abru, and Abru is like water painting. It's like oil painting on water, and then you put like the paper on top, and then you can create some some prints like the ones you see here. And then I I kind of tried to make like a planet map from this uh, into like a, and then use it in three D with some photoshopping on top. And this is kind of the, the stuff I I really like doing. Um, but this is kind of a breakdown on, on the traditional stuff, mixing it with like digital art. Um, this is still enjoyable to do. I think that's uh, the key thing to that I got from it is that um, mixing the different media is definitely uh, key to becoming a more diverse artist, let's say. So coming to my heroes, so I've, I've highlighted some of my heroes uh, for inspiration. Maybe there's some resources that people can use uh, to get some inspiration. So Dylan Cole is one of my favorite artists of all time uh, because he inspired me to do matte painting, getting into digital art in the first place. Uh, and the landscapes he creates are pretty, pretty good inspiration source. Then you have Video Copilot. For those who don't know, he he has a lot of uh, compositing and motion graphics tutorials, and they are still quite insightful on uh, how to use noises within After Effects and creating a lot of different things from from those noises and animating them. It's not necessarily that you know it's not necessarily game art, but I still find it super interesting to watch. Um, for game art related, I would suggest watching Peng Zhu. Uh, Feng Zhu teaches a lot of environment, uh, environmental composition stuff and design. And for anyone in the creative industry, I think this is like very valuable resources to to watch. Even if you just do prop art, I think there's a lot of value uh, in those tutorials, videos. Uh, mainly because um, Feng Zhu also critiques uh, work of of his students, and it's always interesting to to hear him out and and see how he things of the design process uh, of his students and it's uh, even for when I do materials uh, a lot of the philosophy that he teaches kind of carries over into material art as well so um, yeah it's definitely a valuable resource and then a shout out to Timothy Jeremy Kem uh, mainly because during my time in university those have been my main sources of where I you know, met a lot of new people and, and learned a lot uh, from other people. So a uh, big shout out to uh, those three guys. So uh, thank you, Timothy, for hosting. All right, so now we get into the biomaterial creation. Again, I have misspelled the title for the second time. So I'm just going to quickly change it. Okay, perfect. I'm hiding my pain right now. All right. So, uh, generally for my workflow, I love I I 
like to experiment a lot, so I leave a lot of room for trial and error. And generally, when I do designer, I I, I work with noises and then just see where I where I go. Right, I, I don't want to be too picky on the reference. Uh, hopefully, I can show that uh, during this workshop. Um, so I try to not be too nitpicky because generally, when I look at references and I really try to nail the reference, I just get demotivated because it doesn't necessarily look like look like it. But I just go with the flow and and not put too much pressure on myself. Uh, I try to allow for a lot of happy accidents in my work, and and with the happy accidents. It's mainly that I try to explore new techniques to to make certain shapes work. Um, and it sounds a bit weird, but maybe maybe we'll get to it. Um, so beginning of this project, when I made it to Coral, the only reason why I wanted to make Coral was because Coral is cool. And there's a lot of cool patterns. And I wanted to make something that maybe is a bit more alien and... Um, if I want to make something that has a lot of room for interpretation and a lot of freedom, and if I don't have to be, if I don't want to be so nitpicky, I can maybe just create something that's not necessarily has a set, a certain set of references to really try to nail. I can just be, yeah, a bit more exploring different shapes, which was the main reason why I wanted to do it. Um. So for my references, I mainly have been going outside, taking references. The nice thing of living in Mao is that there's a beach close by. Uh, so I, I shoot most of my references. And then if I need additional references, I either go to Google Maps or I visit online resources. Um, so maybe I can show some of the references I took. But here I have a folder of references from... Uh, from stuff I've used within my materials. So I didn't really, for the material creation, I don't really set up a pure ref. I think when I was working on a set of materials, I just opened my phone and just browsed through it. And then, uh, oh, there's pictures of pancakes in here. That's uh, maybe not the right references. Um, let's see. So texture.com has a lot of cool Atlas textures to use. Um, within my material creation, I use a lot of excellent Atlas textures and that's uh, a really nice workflow for scattering different assets in designer. Uh, a lot of, another resource will be mega scans um, to pick uh, Atlases from to use. And then for reference packs, like if you need like a set of photos, then photo bash has a lot of cool stuff. Maybe I can open Photo Bash. Because I love Photo Bash. Yeah, so that's for me, if you're going to make a cool environment, then and I figure out the biome, then I think Photo Bash has a lot of references to, to go from. Because the nice thing is it's, it's all from one location, so dissecting the references is generally a lot easier than when you go on a random Google search and then try to depict what you need for the environment. And since it has a lot of different pictures, it's, uh, it's a great resource. And the same, of course, for Google Maps, uh, since you can just drop your little yellow guy in the middle of the map and just look around in the 360 mode. This is also really great. So yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff in here, also for plants. So I can highly recommend checking out Photo Bash. Um, so let's maybe just start with looking through some graphs and then uh, if there are questions along the way, you guys can just drop it in the chat and then um, hopefully by the end, I will probably just start by looking at some sandstones and coral and then explain how you can make, maybe make some atlases using various programs, 
Uh, but in my material creation, I think I use World Machine. I use a bit of a 3D sampler, uh, ZBrush, Maya, and uh, I think a lot of more different programs, but we'll get to it. Um, yeah, so maybe let's start with just opening a graph and then going through it. Uh, and if there are questions, then let me know. Just drop it in chat. Um, so generally for my materials, I heavily rely on Atlas textures. Um, so starting with like the sand pebbles, um, I started recreating just simple Atlas for sand. Let's see. So this is basically the whole graph I use for most of the pebbles. And all it is, is it's a, a tile generator with just a bunch of, I uh, can't pronounce the name, paraboloids. Maybe I'm, I'm butchering the name. Uh, imagine after four years of doing designer, I still don't know the names of certain shapes, but that's okay. I will hide the pain once again. Uh, I warp it and then what all I have is just, yeah, those shapes. So it's generally super a super easy noise, I'd say. But, you know, since I, within the materials, I, I use uh, 1K per meter. And if I use a 2K, if it's a 2K texture, those pebbles will be super tiny. So they don't need any details, right? So it's just a very simple noise. Um, so going to the initial graph for the for the sand um i heavily rely on atlas scatter and i'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the atlas scatter but all it does it feeds in an atlas texture so in this case it could be uh, a resource from textures.com uh, let's just open text.com let's see I'm sure they have atlases for for, for rocks how are they down Thanks. Okay. Well, they have sticks. Cool. All right. So what the Atlas scatter does, it reads the bounding box of each shape. And what a bounding box is, it's basically, I'm not sure if you're familiar with flood fill. I can't really explain flood fill because I'm not that smart. Um, what flood fill is just it will automatically crop the shapes that are uh, black and white. So what it does, it, it reads the opacity mask and the height map. And when I plug this in, I can scatter a lot of pebbles. Um, so in the first pass, I just scatter 512 by 512 pebbles. I'm not sure what this number means, but it's just, I guess it just means 512 pebbles to the X axis and 512 to the Y axis. Um, and it's basically the same as, as, as any tool in Designer. It's the same as the, the tile sampler, but with more options. So for those who want to get into Atlas, like scattering atlases, then this node is definitely your boy. Um, yeah, so, in, so there's not much to it itself. The only done, thing I've done is just using, making sure you have a lot of random offset to make the material look uh, to make it um, tile well, because obviously you don't want pebbles to be uh, placed horizontally like this. And I, I generally pump up the skill random, so there's a lot of variation. So what I've done in the Atlas scatter is quite simple. So I have the height map here, which I scatter in this Atlas scatter together with the opacity map and what I get from this, if I plug in this into like a preview node, let's see. It's just a bunch of scattered spheres. And obviously it looks kind of poopy right now, I'd say. But I, I, I do it a couple of times. Uh, so I have this one node and I plug this into the height here. So these are my first pass of the pebbles. And for this note, I also use, maybe I should just explain this first. Um, I use this noise, which is just like the standard fractal noise as a base for the sand. 
And then I add these pebbles on top. So this is kind of like my first pass. And then in the second pass, um, I just add bigger shapes, as you can see here. The first shape is just a lot of pebbles. Then in the second shape, I just try to add uh, bigger shapes. And then in the last pass, I just add even bigger pebbles. And the nice thing of this at the scatter is that you can um, also input the normal map, roughness map, metallic map, and also the base color. So it keeps things very, very tight. So I have this plot for info with like random grayscale, and I just plug it into the metallic. Since I don't really use the metallic, but what it gives me is like this uh, grayscale map. And if the, I then after that, I can just plug this into the metallic map underneath here. And when I do a next pass with different pebbles, uh, I have a I have uh, a, a new random grayscale map which I can use for like the coloring. And then in the end, you will have a very nice random grayscale map. And the reason why I do it is uh, in the coloring phase to colorize the pebbles. Um, I can just use this grayscale um, to give every pebble a different color. This makes it super easy to eventually make your soil. So this is pretty much um, so I have a question from Cairo. Does this handle the height overlaps you would get with the tile sampler? Um, yeah, so there are a few options in the at the scatter where you can set the height for for each pass. Um, so if I open the height here and go to the height settings here, um, so there's a height offset, and I can just bump it up so I can put it to ten to to boost the height. As you can see in the tree view, um, I could also do minus one to push it down or minus five. Um, so yeah, it, does that uh, handle the... Um, is that what you mean, Cairo? If you can confirm in chat or do you mean the intersections? Okay, thank you. So Cairo says yes. It, um, so Cairo's question was, does this handle the height overlaps you would get with a tile sampler? So it kind of works like a, a height blend, I'd say. Um, where was I? Let's see. So when I have this normal, it looks fairly flat. And I wanted to give the, the sand overall a bit more definition. And the, the way I did it here was I... I created like a funky noise uh, just by, I just um, blended some noises together and then I warped it and I didn't really have much intention. I just wanted to make something like a random noise and blend it on top of my height map. Um, maybe I can showcase the noise. Um, so this was kind of the noise I made by using some like these filters, so I warped it and I used the normal to hide uh, and then I blended it together and then I had like an effect like this and I'm just looking to add more big macro shifts in my texture and then I used a blur, a blur just to give some eye rest and I blended those together for my height map and then I got at least some variation uh, overall in the high map and I think for the normal map I just added this I just made a normal map from, from my non-uniform blur on the end and I just overlaid them uh, so I kind of handled the high map separately from the the normal map so when I preview this I just kind of fake having those bigger dents in the height map although in the high map you won't necessarily see um, those bumps, but they are in the normal map, at least. Um, let's 
So this was kind of the result. So this is kind of without the edit normal map, and then I would just add the normal map here, just to strengthen. So a lot of choices I make is just what I find aesthetically pleasing, and I wanted to keep the soil relatively flat, so when I blend different materials together, I don't have to... It, it's, it makes it easier for me to blend the different materials together when I keep the, the texture relatively flat, while still adding those nice details in that I wouldn't get if I would just keep uh, the height as it is, uh, like 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 in here. Um, so moving on, I think after this first first pass to create the soil, I created um, an atlas, uh, and these are like shelves that I once created for like a material. I can maybe show the material so you have a clue so i've made this material like a while a while ago um and for this material i use substance sampler let's see if i have it open um, so it looks relatively ugly and it sure it sure does look ugly right now um let's see How does this work i haven't touched this program in a while um, but what I've done is I just picked random images from Google and I delighted the the references in Photoshop. And then I just plugged it in into Sampler and then tried to process it to create a normal map. And the results I got were generally pretty pretty okay. Um, like I wouldn't necessarily be able to do this procedurally, and if I would have to make this. In Zebras, it will probably take me quite a bit of time. And since I'm making an atlas and it ends up so small in the texture map, I don't want to spend too much time um, making something so tedious. Uh, so I generally like to create a lot of things from photos if I can. So I think Sampler, at least coming from like Crazy Bump, I think Sampler is like a super nice tool to have in your arsenal to create a lot of. Uh, cool atlases, so I definitely recommend checking out Sampler if you if you have the time. Um, so what I've done here is I, I processed those images and I got this height map from it. It's the same for this normal map and this base color. And I went into Designer. Um, let's see if I... I don't have the graph here, but I processed the atlas map in Designer as well. Um, and and then I got a, a height map that kind of looks like like the one I have here. Which was actually kind of okay for like an atlas. And this is all by just processing it in, in sampler and designer with no scoping required. Uh, and then I have this as a base color. And of course, it's not really... It's looking quite okay, um, but you know, since since the if you use it in the material, it might only be like a few pixels big, so that's why you generally don't want to spend too much time, uh, you know, creating your atlas. And the reason why I don't want to do it procedurally as well is because designer has computing time, and the moment you start doing everything procedurally your material become very slow. It's not really artistic, you know, that friendly to have a graph that is chunking up your whole PC just to make the material. And yeah, so it's generally really nice to work with atlases. And um, and it's also very fun since in a professional setting, you will probably work with a lot of different artists. And if, if they've made, let's say, some shells uh, for like the environment or they've made a couple of rocks um you can just replace these couple of notes and then scatter something completely different so if i would if i wanted to replace these shells with something else uh maybe i can just preview the material right now um let's see everything looks really ugly right now because the metallic is on Let's remove the metallic. 
All right. Oh, everything is ugly. Please help. All right, I'll just go with this, I guess. So I have these shells here, but let's say I wanted to replace the shells. Um, I can maybe just use this atlas instead. So these are some starfish and I can just plug it in here. Including the opacity and then I would just have starfish here. Which is like super easy to replace and iterate on your materials. Uh, so if I want less starfish, I can just adjust the, the amount. For some reason, it doesn't really show the AO properly. Oh god. What am I doing? If there is time where you want to kill the silence, Timothy, then go ahead. I, I wouldn't mind. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> yeah, feel free in the meantime to ask any questions. Right, while uh, while we while we go through this, um, there was also a question from from me in the beginning. Um, yeah, go ahead. It was more related to the your background, right? Your personal background, because you have such a different way of looking at this because you come from a different background. Um, mm -hmm. How would you recommend? other people to try to expand their horizon on how they look at things. Well, I think a lot of artists probably come from environment art when they when they start getting into designer. And I think the, the biggest hurdle of a lot of people getting into designer is that they try to make everything procedurally. Um, and I guess that's the biggest issue when they uh, I think a lot of artists are able to make rocks non-procedurally just by sculpting it. And I think using the Atlas scatter tools and using the tools that are out there right now in Designer makes it super easy for them to create create good looking textures. But uh, since a lot of people are trying to do it pretty procedurally, I think that's like the biggest hurdle um, to get into material art. Um, Wait, maybe I'm drilling from your question. Can you can you might repeat it again? Mm, yeah, I mean it's it, it sort of it sort of goes that in the same direction, right? But like I mm -hmm. was I was wondering how people break out of that that mind or like that thought process of like, okay, I'm I'm a material artist. I do everything procedurally, but you want to expand your horizon when it comes to that. Like how. Would you would you tell them like, hey, look, stop doing everything in designer and just do do stuff in Photoshop or start sketching and see how that relates back to your workflow? Yeah, I'm, I think in the beginning of designer, I really try to nail the references and then doing everything procedurally. But I, I, I generally didn't really find fun in that because it it's so painful to look at references and then when you fail, you kind of get like uh, demotivated, right? So I, I generally like just to doodle. That's the same when you draw things. If you get if you get too hung up on the references, then it's not really fun. So I generally just like to experiment with notes and and see where it's going towards. And sometimes I don't even look at references. I just try different things. And when I combine a bunch of notes, then I sometimes I I feel like it's getting towards something cool that I recognize. So I might just, let's say, maybe I can just do it live. Let's say I just combine uh, a bunch of notes. Uh, let's do it very quickly. Um, let's say I just combine a bunch of notes like this. And I'm like, okay, this could be this could be mud. And when you start experimenting without references, which is it's really fun because you don't you you create a lot of opportunities for happy accidents, right? So you don't have to focus too much on the reference. You just play around with the notes that are there. 
and, and perhaps you come up with something that uh, inspires you to to go a different avenue, which I I really like personally. But I mean, um, I don't know if it's if that's a good way to go about it. But at least for me, it it works. So a lot of things I I do in my portfolio are not things I sometimes plan to create. It just happens to be. Um, just happens to be something that, that came up during doodling then I expanded on, on that idea um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah the, the reason why, why I asked that question was also because it was very personal right um, mm -hmm. because like even, even with environment art like I spend a lot of time like recreating things like one to one or like not necessarily um exploring as much as i should to to create mm. like a, a new unique thing yeah so and and i think yeah i i guess i always had the feeling that's why i never wanted to work from references either because i always love to do my own thing when it came to that like even if i start from a reference i will still do my own thing with it yeah um yeah it's it's interesting to hear your thoughts on that as well um yeah, I don't want to distract you too much from the workshop either, right? Um, so uh, no, but I, I, li I like to have that conversation because I, I, I think mm -hmm. it is, it is, um, yeah, it is interesting because I think uh, I mean I can I can show some of the work. Like I think a lot of the stuff when I when I when I did this material like three years ago, um, I didn't really look at the references at first. You know, I I was just doodling around and then I found a way to do like erosion lines and then I expanded on that idea and just tried to finish the material and I think a lot of a lot of stuff that you do procedurally is more out of happy accidents I mean that sounds so cringe maybe I don't know but uh, I, I, you know like for me as a materialist I look a lot at, at like uh, nature and I build up a visual library, right? Just like a concept artist would would do. So, uh, getting to that point where you can just doodle might just take a while, though. Because I, I obviously have looked at cliffs a lot. So, for me to doodle a cliff is a lot easier because I've already done it like x amount of times. Um, but yeah, I mean, as an artist, you want to build up that visual library, right? So, if you look a lot at at, at mud, then it will be easier to to make mud out of your head uh, because you, you kind of know the ins and outs of that specific material mm -hmm. to some extent. Yeah. That, that brings, that brings anatomy, us back right? to like yeah. your, your heroes, right? Like, um, because that's, that's the thing that Feng Zhu talks about a lot, like your visual library and how yeah. you need to expand that by traveling and like looking at stuff and yeah. Yeah. Like, and, uh, and, and, tension, but. and that's definitely the thing, right? Like if you do your reference search and you go and you just take to Google maps and, and, you know, Google Images, you don't really see the things that you would see if you just go outside. Uh, and what I like from the reference search that I, I at least do is that when I look at those images, there's a lot of, of cool things you can see that you might not notice when you just look at an image. It's like, hey, where does, um, if I just look at this image alone, can I just zoom in, please? Okay. Maybe there. okay. That's a zoom in. Is that you can see that in this grass that a lot of you can kind of see where the the sea cells collect, right? And on the slopes and where the grass is, you can see like softer sand. So there's a lot of cool stuff you might not notice at first when you just look at a random image. Uh, so here you can definitely see that in this grass, there's almost no pebbles, no no seashells collecting. And then in this crevices, like in this sand variation, I'd say there's a lot of uh, debris and other stuff. And, you know, when you look, go outside and you look at the references, you might question yourself, hey, how could, could that be that those seashells are uh, only in these areas, but not in here, right? Uh, and that's that's kind of interesting when, when I think about it. Um and this one is also pretty cool when you have like uh, a clear variation. Let, let's say this is, would be game art, 
you have a really nice variation of this rough sand with like debris, algae, and, and all kinds of seaweed in between. And then you suddenly just have sand with cool erosion lines. And when I approach material art, it's just really cool to see um, an example of real life and and see how much variation there can be in in, in a biome. Um, and I think those are like cool, uh, cool things to look at. Um, so for some of the materials, you can see some seaweed and there's a lot of cool stuff here. Like you have those, those nice pebbles in between. Uh, you have this fine sand and you can see that the bigger shells, the bigger pebbles are collecting on the very edge of where the seaweed is. Um, so all of those those tiny bits when you do material art is is getting into the nit nitpick area, but that's also like the fun part of it. Um, yeah, awesome. We got some other questions. Um, Cairo asked, do you find it easier to delight light in Photoshop rather than in Alchemist? Or sampler, I, or whatever it's called. Yeah, I usually delight in, in Photoshop. Um, can I open an example? Well, now you should just see a random fish. That's, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the right timing. All right, let's see. Um, but like, feel free to just continue the workshop too, right? And yeah, then, no, um, I, I, yeah, that's, whenever... that's okay. But yeah, I, I'll just exp like for me, just to get into delighting. Just really mm -hmm. quickly, is mm -hmm. I, I I mainly just use the the go to image and then adjustments. I like to use the shadow and highlights and just uh, delight as much as possible in Photoshop, and then I I, I use it in Alchemist. Um, so I kind of do both, I guess, often because I think I think for me Alchemist seems to do better sometimes when I just delight it first a bit in Photoshop. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, Kyra. Um, but I will, I will carry on with uh, with this graph. But uh, yeah, if you have questions, uh, Timothy, from the chat, then keep them going. That's all good. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, the Atlas Scatter allows you just to quickly swap atlases, right? So if you work in a production pipeline, and yeah, or you work in your own personal work, and you want to make changes to the material, then Working in at the scatters, at the scatters is is really easy, and the nice thing of at the scatters is that you can have all your color information, all your normal maps, all, all that stuff, all packed up in a node, right? And then you, the only thing you have to do to make the material is just to um, create a bunch of at the scatters that does the scattering, and then that's the whole material, right? So this is this is kind of is kind of it um, right now I have very low resolution material Let's see so yeah so now I have my soil with with seas with starch uh, starfish and that and if I want to swap it for for shelves then it shouldn't should be quite easy to do. So now I have my M1 Knights back. So this is kind of the approach I had for one of the materials, just for the basic soil and to build up the color. It's um, just to quickly show how I did the color. Um, I have this random grayscale based on the Atlas scatters that I've plugged in. And I, I keep using the metallic as the random grayscale. And then, so this is the first, um, random grayscale I have to use for the color and I just keep on connecting it to the metallic here and then when I add the ammonites with the atlas scatter which are here uh, those boys here then I also have a, a random grayscale for that as well and then I can use this random grayscale together with like using the hide map 
and I I use a bit of noise on top, and then I just run this through like a. I just color sampled this from like a photo. I think I think I just uh, I did it like this. I, maybe I get shot by saying it, but I just used the gradient editor then pick gradient and it just go like this. I'm like, okay, that looks cool, and then I use that. It, I often I just photo source from an image. I don't delight it, so uh, yeah, I'm. I'm I'm lazy like that, I guess. Uh, but then, you know, to blend it well together, I usually do add like uh, dust in the crevices, or I might just add a color on top just to uh, make it a bit more subtle. But then I had like, then the whole color pass kind of looked like, like this. And then usually I add, uh, I use the dust node. So what a dust node does is just combines the ambient occlusion and normal map and then it just creates um yeah a mask to use um for for like dust yeah it says it in the note dust so and then i just blend it together with like a uniform color and then i want to preview it to look like look like something like this and then without the dust uh look a bit too noisy and I generally like to uh, create a lot of eye rest in my materials. So, like, uh, the more eye rest in the material, the better. So, um, so what I liked about the scattering I have here is that uh, there's a lot of frequent noise, but the big shapes they stand out, and the the, the subtle noise kind of um, it's just it's just noise. But I think. When I look at this material, the main things I'm looking at are the bigger pebbles. So that size, that size variation is the one thing that uh, pleases me when I look at this uh, this ground surface. Um, and then I usually like to add some ambient occlusion on top of it. So if I preview with ambient occlusion, it just makes it pop a bit more. Um, and then I use this color match node, and the color match just changes the color of the material. Um, it's, it's basically almost like an HSL node. Uh, a part is, you know, a H, to just get into the nitty gritty of a HSL node, it just shifts to you. But the nice thing of the color match is that I can just pick a, a target color, so let's say green, and then it will change the color to green. Uh, and there is a, so let's say I do red. There's a nice way of um, how how big you want the range to change. I'm not sure exactly how it works because I'm bad at explaining. Uh, but I got this technique from, uh, from Ben Wilson. Um, so Alfie asks, have you used notes like Ben Wilson color variation notes? Um, no, I don't. And I, I sorry, Ben, uh, if you listen, uh, I don't use your uh, color variation node. I love it, but whenever I get into the color variation of Ben, uh, it doesn't really seem to fit within my way of working. I'm a bit of old school, I'd say. Um, so, um, you know, whatever works for you, it works. Um, but I, I, I generally like to work just with the gradient. Um, and I think it's not too complex to work within the gradient. But the nice thing of the Ben Wilson's um, color variation is obviously that you can expose the colors and make it very easy to change. Um, but I think the color match note kind of kind of makes it easy for me to to, shop, to swap the color for something else as well, if I if I wanted to. Um, so yeah, this kind of kind of the first material just for a basic soil um and maybe i can show the sand as well and then after that um after i've shown this graph of sand then i can show the variations i've done for sand um just to showcase on art station um 
So this is the kind of material I showcase now, which is just the pebbles. Uh, in this variant, I did add a bit of sand, but I think right now I will just explain how I did this basic sand, which is more simple than the one I just showed you now. Uh, and then how you can set up the variation. Um, and leading up to that, I will eventually get to a point where I explain how you can get to this point. Because uh, within this material, I've used pebbles, I've used the sand, I've added seaweed, the fish. Um, so it's, it's more of a further step along the way. Um, so I have a question from Cairo. In a production setting, do you find it? Uh, do you find? Sorry, I can't read. Do you find you have to skip interesting storytelling elements, like these shells or starfish, etc., so that the material are more generic or widely usable by other artists too? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, generally, when I make the make a set for materials, right, you always start with the the basic the basic stuff. So I would say this could still be very basic material. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how to, how to answer this question, but I think, you know, in terms of storytelling, um, I, I generally keep it very simple, let's say, uh, cause I, I there's, there are pros and cons, right? You, you can't just make a material and keep adding stuff to add on the storytelling because in the end. I also want to be quick making my materials and I don't want to add too much bits and pieces because nobody will actually kind of see it. So I generally try to add different storytelling for each material rather than adding a lot of different bits in every material. So for this material to explain, um, I only added the ammonites in the pebbles uh, and then for the sand, I didn't add any of the ammonites. Um, so generally, I just so they are, I would say they are more unique then. But I I could technically also add all that stuff in the sand as well. Um, but when I look at the references, what I liked about the references is that everything. When I just look at this reference, for instance, it's that's the thing about nature that's really cool is that. But the variation in real life is also there. Like in the seaweed, I barely see any pebbles. The sand is very clear. And then sometimes you just have a patch where um, where it's just pebbles. So when you when the answer of Cairo is um, do you add certain elements, you know, um, let me just repeat the question. In a production setting, do you find it you find that you have to skip interesting storytelling elements like these shells of starfish etc so that material is more generic but when i look at the references then i i would say that these materials are kind of generic um just by looking at the references so i think real life is just fairly generic so uh it's not a shame to make materials generic as well <laughs> i think it's more like uh, for your portfolio that you want to make something uh, crazy right like but uh, yeah i think nature itself is is kind of yeah kind of generic so you know just like this image as well it's just rock and then next to it it's just mud so uh, if you can avoid the unique features like if you can avoid uh anything to make it tight like of course, you want to make material that tiles well, so as long as you succeed making it tileable, then yeah, then, it's, then you're all good, I'd say. Um, so yeah, let's continue just with sand. Um, let's see where it is. Sand shells. So for this sand, I used a bit of world machine. Um, so the initial graph is, is fairly, it's a fairly simple setup. Um, let me open, let me preview what I have. 
So this is like the beginning noise I have, and all of this it's a, a black and white spots with an upscale, and the upscale just um, makes the texture bigger. And then I use a non-uniform just to add some breakup. Looks it looks super awful right now. Um, then I have something like this, and I'm just playing with noises. I'm not really when I when I made the material, I don't really expect this to look right right away, right? I just try to blend stuff together and see where it goes. Um, and then I have this cloud too, and I just use a uh, slope blur. And then again, I don't. I'm just doodling around and see where it goes. Um, then I use this normal to hide map just to see if I can create a noise that looks cool again. Um, then I blend it together and then I got something uh, yeah that looks like this. And of course this is not much yet. Um, I'm just trying to create a noise that doesn't necessarily look procedural because uh, of course if you make a material you don't want it to be looking like black and black and you know, black and white spots too. Um, instead of this, I have something like this. That that's basically it. Like there's not much to it yet. Um, I mean, I go back to some of the references. Um, like I really like this cool looking sand, and I was like, maybe if I use world machines erosion flow. Maybe I can just use some of those patterns uh, in my designer and I use that as a good base. So I, I went in a uh, world machine and I just exported the flow map of some of the generated terrain. And for those who don't know world machine, all I've done so far is I have a noise, so let's say a pretty noise, and I just export it. That's all I do. Uh, and for the flow map, what I can do is, um, so let's say you have a noise. Oh, oops. let's say I have a noise. I can select the height from the flow map, and then I have something like this, and then I can output it. Uh, and in this case, I generated terrain, I exported the flow map, and I just use this as a noise to create some erosion lines. So if I plug this in. You can see how it looks. It's just uh Yeah, it just looks like this. I, I'm not too bothered in creating this procedurally. If I if I have other tools um that I can use right for my material creation. Since I wouldn't I wouldn't really know how to create these patterns uh, at all um if it was to do it procedurally. Um and I just run it to a normal height just to create a bunch of Weird shapes, I guess. Um, then I blended this together with the base I previously had, and just create some bumps and things like that. And then I use the non-uniform blur grayscale uh, just to create some of those restful areas where there. So for me, I wanted to use those rougher areas for. Um, for where shells collect and then have those soft spots where there's just soft sand. Um, so I imagine the sand, like when it's raining, sometimes you have, uh, you can see the sand kind of becomes a bit more bubbly. I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but um, maybe I can show some references. So what right here, I, I saw that there's a lot of where the water flows, there's not much uh, residue collecting there, and only where um, the, the shelves only collect on the areas where the water isn't really flowing anymore. So I just use that that rule set for this material, and then uh, the nice thing is that you have that variation right from very soft sand to like the rougher patches. Um, and in terms of scattering. There's, there isn't much scattering going on. Like this is pretty much uh, the whole graph that I just shown. 
And the only thing I added is like, some fractal noise just to get some pretty good noise in the material. Uh, and the coloring is really simple. Um, all it is, it's, it's a bunch of... It's... Um, I think I use a black and white spots too with some fractal noise. And I just run it through the gradient. Um, and then I blend together with some... So I, mean, I use like a gradient from like the height map, and I just run it to a, a high pass color, and it's blend together just to create a bit of variation, um, and that's actually the whole color. That's, and I think the material looks a bit more realistic once I actually add the shells, because um, without the extra scattering, it doesn't really feel like it's believable. So this is without the shells. It's just uh, yeah, it's just sand. There's not much to it. Uh, and then I just use the other scatter again uh, to add all the shells. Um, and all I've done here is I just used the mask that I made previously for like eroding. Uh, I used uh, this mask for blurring it. And I've used this mask as well for selecting where I want the shells to be. And then... Um, I scattered the shells with this Atlas shell. And I made this um, Atlas shell in ZBrush. So all I've done is um, I create, maybe I can open the ZBrush file. Um, so I create this one shell in ZBrush and I used, um, I created like a noise in, I think in designer and I, I use this to the to displace all those bumps, and I kind of did the same for like the horizontal bands here. Um, and I generally, for designer, I I like to store everything in layers. I'm not sure if you are aware of layers, but the nice thing is that this is kind of the shape I have, and then all the information is stored in layers. So what I can do is I can create a new layer, and I can let's say uh, draw my name on here. I want to beautiful and I can store it and then um, if I want to make a variation where um, this text is like going the other way around I can just go minus the nice thing is that with those shells is that once you I have done my detail I if I want to make a variation of different shells I can just invert those stripes um, I can do the same for like those bands, right? I can make variations uh, with this single shell as long as I store it, store it in a, in a layer. So I did the same for like the forming. So I have a layer where the shell deforms. Um, I have a layer where I get those horizontal bands. Um, and I have a layer where I add more detail. And in the end, I, I just duplicated the shell and then I messed around with the settings again. And then in and then eventually I ended up with like nine variations of different shells. And then I just rotated them a bunch of times. Um, so there. So now I have like those nine variations. And then I used this kind of cube. Uh, as a boolean, so if I enable boolean, uh, let's see, it should work now. Hello. I guess Zebras hates me. If I'm doing something wrong, Timothy. He, Scream. All right, I think it's not working. Oh, it is working. Okay. Okay, so for the boolean, I just removed uh, part of the part of the shell, and the reason why I done it usually when I I'm in Zebras and I make an atlas, all I do is uh, I go to my document and I set my document size to let's say thousand eighty four. And I resize my document. 
and then I go to document, I zoom out my canvas, and I just press F, and then it kind of, it snaps my shelves to the maximum size. Um, and then I can go to first alpha and just say grab block. And then I have my height map, and then I can just export it and then save it as a PSD. Um, and then I went, this is basically my export. Um, so to create all those variations of shells, I wanted to crack it procedurally because I, I hate separating all these parts uh, in ZBrush and, and it just takes me too much time. So I just created a cells noise and I just run it through a directional warp and then I have like a crack and I just multiply it on top. Then I did it a few times and then I combined them together in a tile generator. And then I had all my variations in here where I have those cracks pieces. And the nice thing going back to the Atlas scatter is that it will just read this as a bounding box. So once I scatter it, I will have those tiny pieces all separately laid out. Um, and so I kind of, now it looks kind of weird, of course, because uh, they all lay together, right? Um, when I go back to this graph here, is that here I have my shells. Oh, fix this casting mask. But once I scatter it, you can see that everything gets randomly scattered, so you wouldn't have to worry about it as long as you, as long as the bounding box is good of your shells, then um, the scattering will look kind of okay. So that's basically it for like the shelves itself. It's a, maybe a bit too much effort, you know, for for just a shell. Um, but you know, that's part of the fun, I guess, to make to make a good looking shell. Uh, but in the end, it just it's it's like two centimeters, maybe max. Uh, maybe it ends up only for like ten pixels. So maybe I should have put a bit less time in it and just. Perhaps I could just have used the um, sampler for this as well. Because I'm sure if you, if you just type in shells in Google, I'm pretty sure when you go in sampler, you can create some cool cool shells straight out of the get-go. Maybe not the most advanced shapes, but if it's just... I mean, I'm sure this will kind of work fine. If you want to do like a sample beach material, Maybe just process the sampler and then see how far you can push it. Maybe we can try it right now and just see where it goes uh, as an example. Um, I haven't touched this program in a while, so maybe it's not the, the, the best thing to do right now. Let's see. Oh boy. Help. This is where my imposter syndrome kicks in. Hello, program. This, this is foreign terrain to me, so you're on your own on this one. Oh <laughs> shit, okay. <laughs> All right, we will get there. We will get there. I'm just clicking everything, and eventually I will, I will get there. Okay, here it is. You got cool. this, man. I believe in you. I, I got this. That's how much I've used it so far. I, the only thing I do is image to material. So. <clears throat> Beautiful. It's, it's amazing how it's laid out here. So right now, wow. That's nice. Okay. I want to get to the settings right now. There should be like settings somewhere. And properties. Okay, cool. Micro details. I do want micro details. Okay, I'm just putting everything on max. Right. 
So just import an image. I think the nice thing of this image is that it has a white background, so it will probably be quite easy, of course, to make like a mask out of it. I'm just gonna make a, an atlas out of this whole thing, and then maybe just replace it with um, with the shells I've made and see if it still kind of works. Who knows? Um, yeah, I mean, the high map isn't really ideal, but let's see. You know what? Just Let's just go with this. I just have to find out where the export button is, because I can't remember. Maybe share. Okay. Export. PNG. That's fine. Let's see. Let's save it somewhere. Shells. It's embarrassing, really. I don't know anything of it yet. I'm, I'm explaining it. Um, I want to export my no map, height map, and base color. Might as well do the ambient occlusion as well. Okay, let's pray it works. Please. All right, that I have something. Okay, that's that's good. All right, so I will make a new graph in here. Shells. Let's go. I import my maps from Substance Sampler. Um, the only thing I'm missing is a mask for the mask from this. So I'll probably just go in Photoshop and import my base color. Then I duplicate this layer and I create a mask. Then I use the color range. The nice thing of the color range, you can just pick the white and then um, you can use this fuzziness to create the mask. And then you can use a nice magic wand. And then use invert and then make it black. Oh, wait, the other way around. Oops. So this is my mask. Um, then I copy this mask over to my base one. And now I have, wait, I just need the black and white. What am I doing? Just need this. This is okay. And then save this over my previous opacity mask. Then I go back to designer and I should have my beautiful opacity mask. And I create a base material. And I define what maps I want to use for my atlas. So I want to use the no map, height map, base color. And it's always annoying because the opacity mask isn't really in here. So I can do this right click and then create output node, which isn't working. That's that's great. Um, and then I just type in opacity and the usage I add opacity in here as well. And then I connect my base color, height and normal. Then I could connect, I can just hit preview how it looks. Uh, in the base material, I want to make sure that the metallic is off. I'm just going to put the roughness to very high value. And then the opacity, I want to right click and preview as opacity mask. So now I have these nice shells, but I'm pretty sure my height will look very bad. So I'm just going to enable displacement. So right now it's not really ideal. Um, but maybe we can process it a bit 
with like the opacity mask. So I'm gonna use a non-uniform blur. And I'm gonna use this as a um a height map together with this noise I previously have. Um and what the non-uniform non-uniform brush is just I have inputted the opacity mask twice in here and then I can just use the intensity here to just create like a bevel uh, and then I blend it together this one with my basic thing and I can already see I can kind of use this as an atlas um, and then blend the opacity mask on this one as well and then put it on multiply and then this will be kind of okay. Uh, the only issue I have is the opacity mask looks a bit too big. So I will just use a bevel node and then use a sol histogram select. And I can just make it a bit smaller. Maybe this is a bit too, too much. Okay, this is not the way to do it. Let's see, maybe in his room scan instead. So this is kind of okay for an atlas. Maybe I can do a bit more with the color, but I think for now it should be okay. And then I've to output to create outputs for my atlas, I can just right-click on my base material, create, and create output nodes, and then create nodes for hidden connectors. I just click now, and then that's my atlas. Uh, so when I go to my nice seashells here, oh, just want to make sure that the opacity mask isn't shown. Uh, so I have. DC shells, and now we've made a new one. So this one we just made, and uh, we can just plug this bad boy in here, and it's super ugly, but that's fine because the color is not good. Well, at least you can see that probably this has been um, probably I've been wasting a lot of time creating this. This freaking shell, you know, in ZBrush, and probably just by doing it in Sampler, I can probably come up with something way quicker without having to spend too much time. Um, and the nice thing is, compared to Pixel, of course, not every studio or freelance you have access to Pixel Mega Scans, so being able to create your own atlases is, of course, very valuable. And I don't think people, I don't think you want to make those shells procedurally either. Uh, of course, you have to check if you have copyright to just use images, but I'm, I'm sure that if you, pro if you process it well enough, then nobody really cares. Um, so let's see if there's any good shells in uh, Quixel. Um, and I think the, the, the hurdle is that um, a lot of those atlas in here aren't really readable. Like they are very small, and I'm I'm generally not much of a fan of those atlases. Uh, I like when I create materials, I like to keep things readable. So even if they end up very small, it's nice to see that it's a shell or it is uh, something that is recognizable uh, to the viewer, right? Um, and yeah, I, I honestly don't really know what kind of shell this is. It's hard It's hard to see from Quixel what you're getting. Um, maybe we can look at text.com to see if they have some cool looking shells. Um, yeah, but then again, like I think a lot of stuff in material creation you can't really find. But there's always plenty of references out there where you can photo source from. So I think that's like uh, 
use it to your advantage, I'd say. Um, so yeah, there you go. There you have a, a nice atlas to use without much work. Um, I'm going to connect this back because I don't like it. Be gone, new atlas. So this is the sand. Maybe we can look at some of the stones. Um, let's see if this is the right graph. So for this example, I use World Machine as well, and you can see the whole graph. It's, it's really big. It's just one node here. It's called the Advanced Perlin, and I just used, I think I used like Swiss cheese, nice some nice Swiss cheese noise, and all I've done is just export it, uh, and then I had this this texture map, uh, and the only thing I had to do is make it tileable. And this make tileable node is all, all I've done here is just um, it's running through uh, a high pass and make it. Maybe I can just plug in a noise to showcase what I'm doing here. Um, So what it just does is it, it, it removes like the, the big the macro shapes by using a high skill grayscale. It just makes it a bit more even. Then I do some outer levels, make it make a tile photo grayscale, and then I use a transform uh, just to offset it. Uh, and then I blend it together by just using mask. And when I run this through, um, when I run a node through this uh, to this setup, um, show you here. I have a make title node, and then I have my noises. Let's see where my noises are. Let's try it with these two. So I can just combine two noises together. Maybe I can do two, two of the same, and then. I just have a noise that is tileable, uh, which I try to use as much as I can. Um, so for my coral stone, I exported two different noises in World Machine. Then I use my make tileable node. Um, and then I use this safe transform grayscale. So whenever you make a material, you obviously want, want it to be seeding. But if you don't have this node, uh, when I see this material, this will be the same in the same position. But when I use the safe transform grayscale, whenever I use a random seed, it will move uh, this noise. So if I have to make a, a, a different version of this material and I will do you do a different seed, that I wouldn't have the exact same noise that, which I would have if I didn't use it. Um, So if I preview this stone from the beginning, um, it will look like something like this. Um, this is pretty good from the get-go. I, I, I really liked a lot of those details. Um, when I made this material, I mainly looked at uh, the stones I find in Momo. I think it's like char, like chalk, like stones with like chalk on there. Maybe I can find the stones here. So one of those stones, like these stones, were kind of my inspiration for the material. But instead of having small stones, I would just try and make this as a big material instead. Um, there's not much I've 
most of that I've done here. I think I usually just do a... Let's see what I do here. I just add noise. So I just have a BNW and I just run into like a blur out. And I just want to add noise. I'm, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Let's let's see. Um, I think I just wanted to highlight a certain edges. So I use like a quantize and I run it through like a slow blur. And I blur it again. Uh, I just blend it together. I'm not even sure if it does much though. Okay, so there's a bit of more definition here. Um, I'm just walking through, and if there are questions, then just feel free to drop it. <laughs> Timothy Dries says, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Feels like a summary of my industry career. Yeah, it does feel like it. Like it's, it's, um, it is weird to explain something where you just, I mean, I, I haven't really opened this graph in some time, and I'm just going through it and, Try to pick my brain what I've done. It's it's funny. Um, okay, so the, the main the main thing I've done here is I have this noise and it looks it looks kind of bulging out too much. I will enable my displacement. Um, and all I've done here is use the slope blur and I inverted my you know, uh, my height map. And when I put that through, I, I kind of created all those craters and it made the texture look more interesting. So I put it on a very low amount. Um, so that was kind of like, kind of made the Swiss cheese, you know, the Swiss cheese noise more noticeable. Um, let's see what I've done here. So this is like the interesting part here, I think. Um, this just looks like a normal stone uh, noise with like holes. Uh, but the moment I, I blend it together with like a darker, it kind of created uh, some more restful areas. And this is what I kind of like a lot from looking at these surfaces is that there are areas where um, the stone doesn't have any, any holes and I wanted to Add that in the material as well. Um, so to create those restful areas, I use a different noise from Road Machine, and it looks like this. It's, it's not really visible. Maybe try this one. Um, so if I go back to Road Machine, it's just the basic advanced Berlin, and I just put it on some random setting that I. I find in the starter settings, and I, all I've done is just export it, and then I have this noise. Um, and then I use this as my basic, as my base, and then I have this noise also from Road Machine that I lay on top, and I put this on Darken, and all it does is just sculpts away uh, the higher the higher peaks of the material, right? So I can, so in this histogram, you can see um, the high peaks. Um, yeah, I can't really show it here. Shit. Okay. I'm failing once again to explain it. Um, but with a darker note, it just uh, removes it based on the values. So if I would Use a histogram range. And if I would lower the position, it would chip away more of the uh, height map. So this is kind of what I did done just to create more restful areas. Um, Uh, and then moving forward, it's, this is just a detail pass because uh, I kind of like the way it looks already. Um, so all I've done here is I created like a weird noise just by using a cloud stew and a slow blur. And I slow blurred once again, just 
with the um, height map as an input. And then I'll run it to another slope there. And then when I zoom in uh, and I preview, I just created some of those cracks, which I kind of like since I didn't really like the surface to just look flat like this. I just wanted some some variation uh, to catch the eye. So there's still some detail in there without destroying much of the material. Um, and then in the next pass, I just use a fractal noise uh, and then I do a slope there again. Uh, I'm not sure if it's even visible, but it just creates a bit of extra noise on top. And that's pretty much the whole uh, height map for like the rock. Um, um, and I think before this, I, I used a tile sampler just to create some extra tints in the in this town. I think for those who use Substance Designer, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I create a mask using histogram select, and then you can just mess with mess with the settings. Um, I want bigger holes, I can make them bigger. I'm not even sure where you can see them. Maybe here. It's barely visible, so. Okay, now you can't see them though. Since my basic no basic noise and rule machine isn't that detailed, I just wanted to add some some extra details that could catch the eye. Um, and yeah, that's the whole height map. And for the color pass, um, maybe that's interesting to show. I just have a, a Gaussian noise. I want it to a warp. And I usually like to maybe blend in some curvature um or like uh, adding some crevices like it will add some peaks to the uh to like a, the noise itself and i i always use the gradient maps right to colorize so it's um i i like to use the light node as well uh, just to make sure that when i create the gradient if i disable it it just creates a bit of variation to um, the different sides of the material um and the uh, thing I like to use is just using um, a super weird gradient and then using a high pass color. And then I overlay it just to create a bit of like color variation. I can do it very extreme as well, maybe preview it with color. Because um, generally with realistic textures, it's nice to, to create, to get like more uh, color variation in just to make it look look more realistic, I'd say. Because the moment it feels kind of uniform, um, you can kind of feel it's it's a bit more procedural looking like. Uh, and yeah, and that's kind of the whole material for the the stones. Um, and the other variations are basically um, different noises from World Machine. Uh, blend it together. Um, maybe I can open one more. So, Timothy asks, when do you know how to call something done in your eyes? Um, okay, it's a, it's a mixture of I'm bored finishing my material and um, um, and, and if I make a material set I kind of I kind of want to get an overall view overall feeling of the set uh, how do I explain this um, it's a tough question Timothy damn um, well of course I look at my material or, or 
to my at my references and uh, the main thing I want to showcase in the material is um, I just want my eyes to look at certain details, right? Like if I look at this, then uh, the main thing of a material like this would just be a bit of the pebbles. The other small bits is not something that I would de de necessarily see. Um, so when I make a material, I just want to highlight um, the interesting parts of the material. So, um, man, it's a hard question. When is something done? Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm struggling right now. Let me let me drink some water. That's all good. It's meant okay. to be a tough question, right? Yeah. Because I, I I don't think I would struggle with this one too. Like um, I've yeah. I've been asked this question as well, and it's like, when do you call something done? Is usually a combination of like a ton of different factors, right? Yeah. Like um, like in the beginning, like you're just mentioning, like I think you're aiming for like the recreation of a material yeah. in this case. Um, but it's always going to be, it's not going to be hyper-realistic, you know, it's always going to be your personal artistic interpretation of what that material is in this case. Oh yeah, I can, I can explain it, I guess, by mm -hmm. showcasing this graph, because of course, you know, when I look at my reference in, in this example, if, if it's loading. All right. Um... But of course, with this example, I could have added a lot more stuff to it, right? When I go back to my references, I'm sure that, you know, I, I could have looked at, at, at seaweed and be like, oh, yeah, you know, I could have maybe added different, like, small fish or uh, plastic debris or that kind of stuff. But I think I just call it done when the main essence of the material is done. Um, you know, I obviously scatter some, some, some nice storytelling bits, like I have these starfish as, uh, as micro details. I added the fish just for extras, but of course I could have added a lot more stuff to it, but I think you wouldn't necessarily see those details or, you know, those details wouldn't necessarily be that important. So I think, um... When it's a texture done, it's, it's, it's done when you have, you know, you, your main essence of the material is there. The main, the main things you want to tell to the player and all the, the small bits is, is an extra. So I would say to this extent it's done, but I, if you want to go further, of course, if I could have added way more uh, atlases. Um, but yeah, I mean, of course, you want to, as long as it looks pretty, right? Then it's done. I'd say. Yeah, I'm not also, sure how it goes with you, but I mean, you don't want to make ugly art, right? <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's that working out? No, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not putting you on the spot. I like your art, Timothy. You're one of my heroes. Okay. Oh shit. no. I, I can't just shit talk you. Yeah. You went from putting me on the spot to like. Ultimate yeah. cringe. Thanks. Ultimate, ultimate cringe. <laughs> uh, Kyra says, I, on the other hand, love to make ugly art. Yes, I, I do too. No shame. <laughs> Hateful face comments. Nice. That's that's good. Um, Where was I? I don't know. You were, uh, um, we just finished like showing off like the second stone material. Oh yeah, second stone material. Maybe I can just show how I blend things together because I'm, I'm pretty sure. Oh, um, okay. No, I know where I'm in. Uh, coral stone. So I've shown this coral stone. I think this is pretty much the same exact graph, except I input different noises. Uh, the only thing I've done here that's different than the other graph is that I added like these swirly bits in the stone. And this is all I've added here. So I used a plasma and 
I just try to create those deep crevices. I warp it a bunch of times. And the nice thing of this multi multi-directional grayscale is that if I set the direction to four, it creates those multiple lines that go across. And what I've liked uh, from this setup is when I uh, look at a lot of erosion stuff in my references, if I can find the exact reference, because I I'm not that organized as many other people are. Um, I like all those those swirly lines, so that's something that I want to embed in something uh, in stone as well. So it looks kind of strange, but I I kind of liked it. It's more of a feeling thing, I guess, rather than looking at references. I I just go whatever rocks my boat, I guess. Um, and then I just put this on darken as a blending mode. So let's see the before and after. Um, so this is what the noise looked before, and then I darken it and then created those crevices and it, it looks cool. There's no reason why I'd done it. I just liked it. Um, and then for the crevices to create a bit more eye rest, I used a non-uniform blur. And in a non-uniform blur, I created like a, a noise from the... So with the swirly bits, I just highlighted the crevices by using the curvature node. Uh, I process it with like a slow blur and then I use a non-uniform blur. And then it just erodes it. And then I blend it back to my original. Um, so that's all I've done since I didn't want it. I don't want it to be just overlaying because it looked a bit too uh, too uniform. And with the blur, I create some breakup and some make it a bit more subtle. Uh, and that's all I've done. And then it's the same exact setup as the previous one. Uh, and the same color setup. So all, all I've done is just uh, replacing the noises and then adding this small bit to the graph to create a variation. There's not much more to it. Um, so then the initial material, I've done a bit of scattering on top of it. Um, so if I open TM curl. O two. Oh, oh one. Okay. So here's my basic uh, stone, um, and I added these switch grayscales. So if I wanted to switch, uh, maybe I can explain later why I added this part to it. Um, then, like in most materials, I use the Atlas Scatter to add more details to my material. So if I preview this, I added some weird looking algae plants. And my idea was that I uh, wanted to have some fossilized uh, plants in um, stone. So maybe I can Google it to showcase. Uh, so I wanted to create something like this where you have like maybe some algae in the plants that are uh, carved out uh, in the stone. Um, and um, I want it to be carved in, so I just put the direct... I usually just make my materials in OpenGL, because I, but I wanted to my the fossils to be um, carved in, so I just put it on DirectX instead. So it's kind of just goes against BBR logic, I guess. Uh, but you don't really see it because it's in the high map. It's it's so little. Yeah, I don't know. It 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 worked for me. So it, yeah, here you go. You have inverted normals uh, in the material. Um, and then I I I, I kind of scatter the same exact uh, algae a couple of times.
Uh, and for this atlas, uh, I also used a bit of probe machine. So I, I generated like a, a flow map and then I cut out some parts that I like from the from the flow map. I'm not sure if I have um, a preview of the flow map. Um, This is kind of how the flow map looks like, and for me the flow map looks relatively interesting because it has a lot of, it almost looks like trees or it looks like something that could be algae. So I just cut out all the bits and pieces that I, I liked that could have been like some kind of seaweed. And then I just process it with designer uh, using blur nodes, using uh, yeah, I just process it. Maybe I can showcase it in 3D instead. Um, how it looks. So yeah, it looks relatively poopy. But I think the moment I process it more, it's, it becomes slightly okay. Uh, yeah, it's not it's not great, but I think, you know, the moment you kind of use it, uh, it becomes a lot smaller, so then it, it's not really that noticeable uh, how bad it looks. Um, let's see. So yeah, this is basically the whole atlas I've made just by using uh, some noises that looked interesting to me. Um, and then in this example, I have uh, sand that I already showed before, which I use into a material blend. Um, and the material blend node is, is quite easy. You have uh, one material here, and I have one material up here, and I'm plugging in all the maps here, and then it's just using a grayscale mask to blend uh, to blend the materials together. So I have my my height map uh, of my rock, and I have my height map of the pebbles, and then I can I expose this setting. But if I let's say I do reset, um, so with the height offset, I can introduce. Uh, it's loading. I can introduce more soil to the material. So if I wanted to make like a, a, a seed of this material, all I have to do is just expose this height offset and, and then seed it. And then I would have a different material. So for the variations of the crawl stone, if I open the second one, so I have my crawl stone two. This is my variation, and I run it through my TM crawl stone O one. That's the one I've showed before. Uh, so in this material, I have these uh, switches. So if I wanted to swap out Coral Stone 1 here in this chain, I can swap it with a different one. And so for this one, I set up like a switch. Um, so what I do is, if I wanted my second variation to be Coral Stone 1, I can just drag it into here and then plug it into 
this chain here. Oh, this is the wrong note. Um, And then I would have a different material. So it, it makes it really easy to, uh, to swap things around. And I also made a switch for the sand. So if I would uh, enable enable this this thing as well, I could maybe try trampled sand instead. Um, and plug that in. I hope it works. Maybe I, I hope I set it up correctly. Um, okay, it's not working yet, apparently. Let me double check the graph. Okay, something is going wrong. I'm not sure entirely. I'm not entirely sure what is going wrong. Um, oh, I know why. Okay. So with the new version of Designer, I'm 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 really used to like the old version of Designer, and for some reason they they swapped the color of the highlighting of the of the buttons, and it's it's I can't get used to it after a few years of using Designer that they swapped the the highlighting. Uh, so sorry about it. I just blame Adobe uh, for this part. Um, yeah. I guess Adobe ruins it. Sorry, Adobe. Can you, can you, can, if Adobe is listening, can you guys swap this around? So when I click pulse, it becomes a different color than dark, but light instead. Um, yeah. So the nice thing is that I can, with these custom switches, I can still change uh, what kind of soil I want to use for my material. But if I wanted to use my sand shell, sand with shells, uh, I can just replug it into uh, this setup um, to create the variation. I hope it's working this time around. Uh, and then I can use the height offset that I've exposed um, to allow how much sand I want to get let through to the texture. Timothy says, I will start a petition. What do you what do you mean, Timothy? For Adobe to switch around the colors again. Yeah, yeah, that will be helpful. Like uh, <laughs> otherwise I wouldn't have these streaming issues, right? Exactly. Yeah. Have you run into those issues when, when streaming? Just a random question. Where where you um, where you're struggling? <laughs> I mean, when when I was streaming my art, like it would be constantly stuff like that, right? Okay. Yeah, so, I didn't come. I didn't come prepared. So. Uh, 
<laughs> the actually the, the thing is that I actually uh, I actually used um, Substance Designer 2018. I still use 2018. I just swapped to 2020 yesterday. Um, mm -hmm. Same yeah. here. Although I have 2020 for like two years, I just didn't use it. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have any questions yourself, Timothy? Because I I don't. I can continue, uh, but it's it's. Um, hmm. Maybe I can showcase the seaweed part, and then I think that's about it. I guess. Yeah, that's that's good, right? Uh, um, I think um, it's almost been two hours anyway, so yeah. it's good that we're kind of getting towards the end. Um, just also as a reminder for people that are still here. Um, feel free to just ask any question right like um since we're coming to the end if we have a lot of questions we might do like a separate q a uh depending on the amount of questions that we get it doesn't necessarily have to be around what you see on screen it might also be like the broader topic of material art yeah like anything is fine for me like i i, I don't mind showing like it's generally easy, easier to explain if there's questions otherwise i'm just you know talking out of my head uh but yeah, I can continue. Um, so I have these sand, uh, the same as with the corals. I I made uh, the blending of sand also in the same way. So if I open my graph here, I have the sand pebbles and sand shells, and I use the material high blend uh, to create the variations of different sand types. Uh, so this is the whole setup I I have for uh, those different sand materials so this would be just normal sand with seashells then a variation where the things are blended together uh, and then the, four, the, the the other one would just be sand with more pebbles uh, and all I've done here is just create a setup where uh, I exposed uh, this height offset and contrast uh, and then I have these three different graphs so in the, the TM sand O2 it will just be referencing TM sent 01, but just using a different height offset as the 01 version. Uh, and then the TM sent 03 is the same graph again, but just using a different height offset. So this would just be the variation. And then I will generally just use a different seed here um, to create a different texture. So these are generally just all the variations I have for the sand uh, just based on these two materials um, I don't I don't really use the trampled sand it's just if I if I want a trampled sand I could, I could probably uh, swap things around um, so what I could do um, as a test is just to Swap trampled sand with this one over here. It will not. I'm not sure how it will look, but we can just test it. Um, and then the result will be. Let's see. Um, It's working. Okay, it might take some time since the computer time is a bit slow. It seems like anything today will just fail. Oh no. Oh no, it's working. Okay. It's, it's really slow. Okay, let's test it again. So yeah, so now it's just using the different sand. And if I wanted to swap uh, a different soil for something else, so in my material creation, 
I would, uh, if I would use Quixel or Texture.com, I can just make a node that has the, the scans in here. And if I wanted to switch up a different soil, all I have to do is just um, swap this part with something else, and then I would have a different version. Uh, so I, for for like iterating on like a whole set of materials, it makes it super easy to to swap things around since it's just uh, only relying on just swapping this part of the graph, uh, and then instantly it would update my TM send O one and my other send materials as well, uh, which is quite helpful. Uh, and then coming to the where all the, all of the things kind of come together is with this material, where I all also added like more things on top, right? So the seaweed, the fishes, uh, and also adding the starfish, uh, and then using the the different soil as a base. So if I open that graph. Um, So this is my basic sand. Um, for some reason I changed something in the sand. It used to be more of a variation between pebbles and sand, but I think during this workshop I might have messed something up. But for now I will just go with it. Um, so I have the seaweed graph here and because I didn't really like the color I used the color match node just to to swap things around and I just used uh, just this color editor and it and I selected something that made it fit more together um, and there's not there's not much to the way I work, it's just I keep adding stuff with the Atlas scatter. Um, so in here, in this part, I've only blended the seaweed together with the sand. And then for my references, based on the stuff I've seen in my uh, collection of images, uh, when I looked at the seaweed, is that it had a lot of pebbles. Um, it had, a, it had a lot of pebbles and, and like shells in between um, the seaweed. And uh, at first I didn't really knew how to blend these things together since without the pebbles it kind of felt a bit off. It didn't really feel like it blends well together, especially on those edges. It doesn't really feel real. So once I added the shells, I kind of, it kind of felt like it were more blending together. So to blend it together, I use uh, a curvature node and I just uh, use a histogram scan to select an area where I wanted the, the cells to be located. And I used, um, I used to uh, kind of blend those together and then I just removed the top parts of the seaweed where I didn't want any pebbles to be. And then I just used it uh, in the mask random and then you can see that all my pebbles, they start spawning uh, between within the graphics of the seaweed and on the very edges. Uh, and when I looked at the references, then I generally uh, noticed where the pebbles, you know, usually kind of collect near the seaweed. And in the open areas, there were there was not usually not much of the uh, the stuff collecting there. So. Um, that's something I kept I kept in mind when creating the material, uh, and then I just keep on scattering stuff. So I make a mask for where I want the starfish to be, uh, and I just use the height map here, and then I use a history cam select. I just wanted the starfish to be um, on the edges of the seaweed, um, and I.
again, I didn't really put too much thought in, this, in where the starfish should have been. It's more of an added storytelling part that I like. Um, and moving further is that I added some... I thought I added some plants in here as well. Um, no, I only added some fish. So uh, the fish I added and then that was the whole material. Um, I think as a joke, I added in another material in here. Um, this is more of a material artist geek thing, I guess. Is that there are like flowers in here, like kind of, um, it's almost like SpongeBob looking shapes. And I like, I like to have pink starfish in here. So it will, it will kind of resemble Patrick from SpongeBob and SquarePants. But I think nobody really catches on uh, my silliness, I guess. So the material I have here is called Terrain Material Patrick 01. Uh, but I guess in a professional setting, I would probably not name it Patrick, but it would have been funny, I guess. Uh, so there you go. It's Patrick Star. Um, and, and maybe. The coral has kind of a spongy feeling, so maybe I should have named it SpongeBob and Patrick. Um, yeah, so that's this is also my favorite material. It's just because of the big brain storytelling behind it. Um, um, yeah, where do I left? Where should I continue with? I don't really know. I'm not sure if there's any questions. Maybe I go too fast or too slow. I don't know. No, no questions. You... I think uh, I think you're going in like really detailed, right? Um, I love okay. this section about like blending it all together as well. Um, so really cool stuff. Oh yeah, I can only, I can maybe show how I did the fish, and then I think then it's a kind of a wrap up. Um. Yeah, that would be awesome. The fish that's, is a that's, really good example. The fish is really simple. Uh, well, I say everything is simple, but that's maybe not the best way of saying it. But I have this beautiful image of a fish, and I found it on Google. And I, I just trace it um, in Maya. I just trace it molding. And I just use... Um, I mean, I just started with the cylinder, right? And just try to mold the fish out by hand. I didn't really use any sculpting for this part. Um, so once I had this fish, I went into ZBrush. Um, and I can open my ZBrush file. And I have this um, beautiful fish here. Let's disable the color. Um, so I imported the fish and then obviously um, I had to, maybe I can, can I do it now? Maybe I can just explain it instead. Uh, of course, a lot of this detail I actually got from the, from this illustration from, from this fish. So I've done in, 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 in um, maybe I can show in ZBrush. Let's see. So I went into ZBrush and I imported texture here. Uh, import texture and then I imported my beautiful hair ring. I just have to make sure it's the right one. Okay, it's supposed to be this one. Okay, cool. So I have my hair ring and then I can add it to the spotlight. Uh, and it's really nice. And then what I did is I used a standard brush. So in this case, it's BST as shortcut. And then I went into, uh, I can just create a new layer for now. Um, and and when you press Z, you, you can 
move your image around here. And when you click Z again, you can lock the image. And then I make sure with the standard brush that I have RGB on. What I can do is I can project um, the illustration on top of the model. And if I put, uh, select flat color, then you can, you can kind of see that now you have this beautiful stock photo on top of your sculpt. And of course, with a bit more care, you can make it look better. Uh, so maybe you can try and put in some uh, effort here. Let's see. Beautiful. So press Z again to move the fish around. And then let's paint this fish completely. Okay, this looks a bit scuffed, but it's okay. It is indeed fishy, kind of fishy. Gotta, gotta steal everything you can, uh, Adam Denker. All right. So now I have this nice painting detail. I can, uh, I can press C to color pick and just paint, paint those weird areas away. Um, and once I've done that, um, I go into my, let's see my fish. Um, I can disable the poly paint here. So let's say I just remove some of those details again. So I go to a lower subdivision just for, so let's say my base basic model looks like this when it's subdivided. Uh, when I wanted to have a lot of those details from the fish, um, what I'd like to do for, what I did for this fish is that I, um, I enabled my polypane and then I went into masking and in the masking you have mask by color and then you can use mask by intensity and when I disable the polypaint you can see it kind of creates a mask based on the intensity of your polypaint and when I create a new layer um, I can go into the formation and there's this inflate tool and I just inflate it and then you can kind of see that you you get some some details from your base color uh so kind of like um and what i can do now is that i can disable this layer oh. um i hope it works let's see something happens that i don't like um Okay, let's do it once again. Sorry, Scott. Uh, sorry, Scott Burns. If it's confusing, I, I will. I will hopefully get to it. All right, polypaint. We've done it. Okay, now we want to detail the fish. I can go to masking, mask by intensity. Um, create a new layer. Disable the polypaint. Now I have a mask for my detailing. Um, and if I use inflate, you can see I have all these kills on the fish already. So it saves me a lot of time actually detailing the fish. And of course you have some errors in the model. And to remove those errors, I can um, disable the layer and create a morph target. And then I can enable the layer again. Uh, disable the polypane because it's in the way. And then with the morph target, I, I stored my smooth model. And when I paint with my morph target, it 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 will um, remove those errors from my scope. Um, as you can see now, if I can make this part smooth. So if I use smaller intensity, uh, sorry, I'm actually kind of a criminal because I'm using my mouse to scope right now. So please don't don't shoot me. Uh, I just like to scope with mouse sometimes. Uh, no judgment, please, Timothy. Same. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is 
basically how I deal with the whole fish. I don't really spend too much time detailing uh, this whole fellow. Um, so now I went from boring flat fish to detailed fish just by using the poly paint. Um, and then for the poly paint itself, I did a bit more work. I think I also used a bit of Photoshop. Um, and because this is obviously just an illustration, it's not really a good base color. So I've used uh, a few other stock photos on top. Um, and then I, I poly painted it again. So I made like this. So in Photoshop, I I made like a side projection of the fish I had in ZBrush. So this is the fish I have here. And then what I've done is that I, I exported my side view of ZBrush and then I went in Photoshop and I Photoshopped my base color together. And then I went back in ZBrush and then I uh, painted my final herring with like uh, and then it looked like this and then if I change it to so this will kind of be the how my fish look uh, with everything together so this is kind of the workflow I use for detailing the fish and of course I spend a bit more time um, to add a bit of more realism to, to the fish itself but I mean, most of the details do come from like the base color. Um, and yeah, and then in the end, um, just like with the, the shells, I made it into a atlas. Um, so here, here are my four variations of fish. Uh, and to create those variations of fish, I post them in layers. So I. I have my variations here, so I have one that's maybe bended. Um, so I, those are the variations I would then export. Um, and to export, it, all I do is uh, grab dock the height map. And for the base color, what I do is I go to my uh, material here and then I just use flat color and then I can also just uh, go to texture and then grab look in here and then uh, I can just export the base color here and export the height map and, uh, and then I just have these four variations and then I have the base color together and then the height and then the height map and that's uh, basically the atlas for the fish um so let me get back to the material so we've added the shells we added the starfish and we added the fish um and then the final It'll take some time to load. That's okay. I have this. And the only thing that I left out is I used this. I created this seaweed by World Machine. So I created the flow map again uh, in World Machine. And all it is, it's it's like a purling noise. And I run it through like an erosion. And then I got all these, these, these nice shapes. And I processed it using... Um, I inverted it, uh, made it tileable. Uh, the only noise that I, the only thing that I really liked from this part of the material that I used is with Neptune Material Light. Uh, and I, I really like this note. Uh, I started use, using it more often just for one function. Uh, there is this, um, where is it? Depth balance. It's a cool way of warping, I'd say. I'm not sure how it works, but I kind of like the effect. So if you want like a different way of warping, uh, the depth balance was super cool. Uh, just, just put it out there for people to use. Uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure how to replicate it in a different way. So, um, bit my bitmap to material light is is cool, cool beans. Um, yeah, and all I do here is is I, I, I try to blend it together to a, to. A, I have no clue what I'm doing here. Wait, give me a second to read. <laughs> All right, okay, I know where I'm at. So in the t in the bottom part, I wanted to have like big macro shapes, and then I blend it together with like my um, with the stuff I got from Road Machine, which looks super noisy. But the moment I blend it together. Um, I think I blend together here, so here is just the big shapes together, and then I, I blend things on top. Uh, because the, the basic, the thing I got from, from Road Machine is obviously uh, not really working as a height map. So to create a height map, I, I just uh, blur it and then use slow blur. There's a bunch of blurs and slow blurs to create a noise that features more of those big shapes. Uh, and then do more processing using blurs uh, till I get something that uh, that's enabled the height map. So I went from something like this to something like this, and this this was quite usable for me. Um, the only thing I've done here is use my normal to hide thing just to create a bit of an offset. I'm not sure why I did it here, but that's what I do, I guess. That's not really. I guess I just wanted to break the uniformity of how the displacement looked like. And as long as you, I can add more breakup to my displacement, I think that's generally a plus. And since the normal to height is fairly cheap and it's just one note, it's, it's super nice to use. Um, and then there isn't much to this, to this part. It's the same coloring setup I use throughout all my materials. Uh, the only thing I added here is extra pebbles in like the crevices. Uh, so to highlight, to create a mask for the crevices, I use the image occlusion, uh, use the histogram scan, and then I use the same same mold atlas scatter uh, to scatter all those pebbles in between the seaweed. And if I preview uh, the end, you can see there's like tiny pebbles in the crevices just to create a bit of more realism to the material. And then in the final, it all comes together. And you can see those those tiny pebbles in here, uh, which is kind of the same color as the um, as the sand I made previously. So it's it should be um, kind of the same as No, that's not the wrong one. That's the wrong one. This one. It should be kind of the same color as these pebbles. So once I blend it together, it should kind of fit. And that's pretty much uh, my whole workflow for uh, this whole biome material. Um, yeah. I don't think I, I have other tricks that I've used that I can spoil for you guys so if there are questions then let me know i i think that's about it yeah thanks so much derek thanks so much for uh all the cool stuff that you've shown i think um i think scott brought it up earlier and this is also why i was a big fan in our early talks when we were deciding on what the workshop should be about Mm -hmm. when you showed off how everything kind of like interconnects and how you make it like really modular and then yeah. use like unique ways of of creating these things with like 
ZBrush and like a projection mapping and a world machine. It's just, yeah, really interesting to, to hear how you work. So thanks so much for uh, showing it off. Yeah, and I mean, uh, what would help, I, I can show an example of yesterday, which is like, I, I said to Timothy prior to this stream, I wouldn't show, but it was just too much fun to not show. Because <laughs> now we're going back this, to the pancakes, right? <laughs> I, I have this pancake photo. And to be fair, I made this pancake and it, it was delicious. The saying, okay. Uh, and the nice thing of pancakes, it has cool shapes. And why limit yourself with using notes in designer when you can make pancakes and create something cool out of it, right? So I processed the pancake in Photoshop. And then I, I, I made it bigger and I made it tileable. So now I have inf infinite pancake, and who doesn't like infinite pancake, right? Um, and then I process it, uh, and I use the same old node that I used before, and I... Um, so let's see. So now I have a noise that looks like this. Uh, and all I, all I do in this slow blur is just um, making those holes feel bigger. Uh, and I just like the idea of making a material out of a pancake because it's like funny, I guess. Uh, right? So if you, if you give this to another artist, then he sees the pancake and I'm sure that it will make his day really happy. He will be a very happy man. Uh, so that's, that's also a fun thing to do, I guess. Um, and with this pancake, I wanted to create some coral shapes. So I have this weird shape. I'm just going through the graph without explaining too much. But hopefully, you know, you, you will you will be inspired to do something with pancakes as well. Or something else, who knows? Um, and I mean, this is just me having fun, right? I, I'm not really looking at many references at this point. I just want to see if I can create something from a pancake. And eventually I might be inspired by some of the stuff I do just by doodling. And, you know, that's like the happy accident part is maybe you create something that, that looks cool. And uh, maybe I could have used it for like some zombie flash. I don't know. Like, I think that's the, the fun part of designer is when, uh, yeah, you can just try things out and see if you can create something out of out of just yeah mm -hmm. little link and yeah that's, that's the thing that i that i love about like designer like it's very it's very aligned with what we talked about in the beginning like the exploration part mm -hmm. and even even now when you see people like posting in in the chat talking about like oh um that could be like uh like fungi material or like moon craters um and i i kind of look at this and i'm like oh this would be cool as like lizard skin you know yeah exactly and i think it's... that's the nice part is when you if you do learn if you want to learn designer and you do a lot of random exploration you might just be like uh, during your creation you might be like okay this could be could be a chameleon skin or this could be moon craters right and in the end it's just recognizing patterns right and just try to make something out of those patterns to make material and i mean and, and I think that's the fun part is it's you can just do it all around and see where it's going. And that's why I don't necessarily if I want to learn designer, I don't want to be stuck with certain references because it's not really that fun to try and nail references for me. Like I, I get the coolest things just by doodling around. Of course, it takes some time to, you know, be able to do it all around because it's, of course, you have to learn the basics. But I think once you kind of know the basics and just doing your random explorations is where a lot of fun and a lot of cool stuff can be created and I like that part of it. Thank you so much Derek for taking the time to share this amazing workshop for us at Beyond Extent. Make sure to check out Derek's work in the description below. Also, a big shout out to all of our Patreon supporters. These workshops are funded because of your support. 
If you want to participate in the workshops live, are looking to view your skills as an environment artist, or just want to become of an amazing community filled with them, then head on over to beyondaccent.com, where you can find all the tools you need to help you on your journey as an environment artist. See you there.